Uh, is Andrew Itzen. Andrew Itzen. He is one of the preaching ministers at the Madison Church of Christ in Madison, Alabama. Alabama. Before that, he was the uh, preacher at the Robertsdale Church of Christ in Robertsdale, Alabama. And before that, he was the college minister at the University Church of Christ in Montgomery. Uh, Andrew is uh, married to Lori Ann, and they have three children. Unfortunately, they were unable to be with us this weekend. But uh, we are blessed to have Andrew here. Uh, really enjoyed his lesson last night. I know he's uh, going to uh, have another powerful lesson this evening. Uh, Andrew uh, is just a, a, a great guy. We got to spend a lot of time together today. I took him down to the College Football Hall of Fame um, because he, like me, has a team that hasn't done much lately. And so we just needed to feel like we were special for a moment. Um, his team, by the way, his team is FSU, just for the record. Yeah, see, that's the reaction I get when I announce that I'm an Arkansas fan. Oh. You know, but uh, we had a great time today, and uh, hopefully tomorrow you can see him kick a field goal because I do have the video still. <laughs> anyway, uh, with that, uh, let, let's uh, turn it over to Andrew and enjoy another study from God's Word. Thanks, man. Uh, whether you realize it right now or maybe you realize it sometime later in your life, eventually, whether it's now or later, you will find out that any type of success or growth that you have had in your life you will notice that the right people came along at just the right time and they helped you get there. But you've also probably seen in your life too that any type of disappointment, hurt, or heartache you have experienced in this life, the wrong people came along at just the right time and they helped you get there too. That if we can get our relationships right, then it can set us up for more success, more growth, more strength than we ever thought possible, but the flip side is also true, isn't it? That if we get our relationships wrong, they can set us up for a lot of disappointment, hurt, and heartache. Relationships, they matter. And I think that's partly why Paul says what he says in Ephesians 4, as he gives this heading and focus of the importance of the body of Christ being unified because it's good for us but like we talked about last night it's good for our communities too and so in this text he's called us to one body one spirit one Lord one faith one baptism one God and Father that's over all in all and he's through all and so the very first thing he mentions in this list is one body we say that friendships, relationships, they matter, but it's very difficult to make something matter that today is very difficult to define. And what I mean by that is the word friend has been one of those words that's evolved over the years. That the word friend does not mean today uh, what it used to mean. If I would have said several years ago that you and I are friends, you would have assumed that we do life together. Uh, we maybe go on trips or uh, we, we know each other and maybe know some details about each other's lives. We might have cried together, laughed together, done some stuff together. But, but today when we use the word friend, I think a large part because of social media, it can just be people that we are maybe acquaintances with, that maybe we just know about but we don't really know. And, and because of how we view friendship now, here's the issue. It's easy to enter friendships, but it's also even easier to exit friendships too. An example of this is several years ago, Burger King did an ad campaign where, where they noticed that social media was on the rise. And so they said, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna encourage you to unfriend or unfollow 10 people on your social media. And once you give us those names, we're gonna send them a private message and we're gonna let them know that they have been unfriended because you wanted to get a free Whopper. So every person that got unfriended got a, a free, or the, the person that did this, they, they got a free Whopper. And here's what's interesting. By the way, that's a great marketing uh, tactic, especially because no one goes to Burger King. So it makes sense why they would do something like that. So within, get this, 10 minutes, they had over 200,000 people send 10 people this notification that they're no longer friends because they wanted a Whopper. So that meant within a few minutes, millions of people got unfriended because of a Whopper. Well, 
A few hours later, Burger King put a halt to it because they were losing so much money and knew they would. And this is what they were quoted as saying, we didn't think that many people would unfriend that many pe people that quickly. And that's kind of what I'm talking about. Um, that the word friend, it truly has evolved over the years. And, and it's, a, it's a bummer that maybe we don't view friendship the way we should and relationships the way we should. Because as we're going to see tonight, there's a direct connection between our resiliency in this life and our relationships. I want to give you an example of this. When you see this picture, some of you may not know what it is, but a lot of you probably will. What is that? The Berlin Wall. I wasn't there in 61 when it went up, but in 1961, uh, this wall went up separating East and West Berlin and East and West Germany. And one of the things that they started to notice around the wall, the hospitals, the psychiatrists, the counselors, the psychologists, that since the wall went up, that the suicide rates were up, that depression was at an all-time high and anxiety was at an all-time high all around the wall. But then they noticed the further you got away from the wall, the anxiety went down, the depression went down, and the suicide rates went down. Why? Well, they began to study it and began to look at it. Well, here's exactly what happened. Communities of people that used to enjoy life together, now there's a wall right down the middle of them. Can you imagine churches that used to be together, now there's a wall right down the middle of them. That parents that used to enjoy the PTA are no longer doing that because there's a wall right down the middle of them. And, and kids that used to play on the soccer fields together, they're no longer doing that because there's a wall right down the middle of them. Well, would you know it, the wall eventually, of course, comes down, and when it does, guess what goes down? The anxiety, the depression, those suicide rates, those begin to go on the decline because of these walls that were put up separating people. This idea of understanding the need for friendship is directly connected to resilience. Gordon uh, McDonald in his book, Resilient Life, and I'm not gonna read the whole thing. He says the older you get, the more you get to understand this value of what he likes to call the happy few. It's those people in your life that speak the things you need to hear, but also sometimes the things you don't think you need to hear, but you do. It's those people that come along and give you the encouragement, give you the support that you need. At the very end of this, he says this, resilient people know this from experience. There is a direct connection between your resiliency in this life and the relationships that you have. Jesus knew this. In fact, as you go throughout your Bibles, one of the things that you'll notice, is this word friend, sometimes I think we've tried to modernize it, that this is a biblical word. The word friend is a word that Jesus used in the text we're going to look at in just a second three times. It's from the same Greek word phylos, which is where we get the word phileo, that brotherly love. You think about throughout scripture this phrase, one another, love one another, serve one another, encourage one another, devote yourself to one another. Over 100 times you read that. Paul, he starts 1 Corinthians chapter 1 like this. We have been called by God to be saints together. This is how we are designed. This is how we have been made. In fact, just to, to kind of kick it off, why do friendships, why do relationships matter? Well, part of it is this is how we've been designed and made. I, I like to view John 13 through 17 kind of like Jesus' last will and testament. Do you all remember those from senior year? It, it was like the last send-off of things you were going to give the, the class that was below you. And in his send-off, this is what he says, and we don't have all the time to get through all of it, but in the last few chapters, you'll notice that the main focus of what he wants to give before he leaves this earth is the importance of relationships. He says, as the Father has loved me, that's how I've loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. This is my commandment, that you love one another. And what's the standard of that love? as I have loved you. Now, why does that matter? You, you might remember also in the Bible, it says a new commandment I give to you, right? We, we see that a lot, that, I, that you love one another. Was that commandment really new? No, it shows up in the book of Leviticus. But the standard in which we love one another is new. What he's saying is the way that, that 
I have loved you. That's what I want you to reciprocate and give to other people. And he said, the standard is not because, you know, I'm looking down, I'm like, man, have you seen that Andrew guy? He's just so great. No, he's like, listen, I've looked down and that Andrew guy, he's messed up. Like he's got a lot of stuff wrong in his life. But you know what? I love him. And and the way that you, you see that kind of love that I give to you, even when you don't deserve it, that's what I want you to give to other people. He says this, greater love has no one than this, than someone that lays down his life for his friends. And he says, in fact, you're my friends if you do what I command you to. And then show this, this is an amazing example, and he says this, no longer do I even call you servants. For the servant doesn't even know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. Now, to us today, when we hear that statement, I'm no longer calling you a servant, but I'm calling you a friend, it may not mean a lot to us today, but for the audience that was reading this text then, that meant a lot. See, because during this day, servants could never receive an inheritance from the master. That if the master died and there was no family, the person that got that inheritance next, guess who they were? They were a friend. So he's saying, I'm moving you from the place of servant to friend. And so he says, you did not choose me. That's what I was talking about earlier. He's not like, listen, at times you didn't even pick me. But I I picked you and I chose you and I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask in my name, he will give it to you. These things I command you so that you will what? Love one another. But I want you also to go back to the garden for just a second. Do you remember when after God had created all the other things outside of mankind, he said they were good? And then he created man. And and right before he created man, he made this statement. He said, let who? Us make man in what? Our image. Well, who's the us? Who's the our? It's what we maybe call the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Since the very beginning of time, God has existed in community. So that's why we say we were made for it. We were created in it. We have been designed and created by a community for the community to live in glory for that community. That's why he created us in community because that's what he was made in. So you fast forward even further and he looks down and, and he notices that Adam is all by himself. And what does he say when Adam was by himself? It's not good, right? It's not good that he's what? Alone. And when I was younger and I would read that, I used to say and think, well, the reason why he said it's not good for Adam to be alone is because Adam's such a mess up. That Adam's just messing everything up. He's doing stuff he's not supposed to. But let me ask you, when God said it's not good for Adam to be alone, had he eaten of the tree yet? No. So before the sin had even entered in the world, he looked down and said, no, no, this is not how it needs to be. Well, there's several reasons. See, because since the very beginning of time, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they've existed in community and being made in the image of that, that means we're made for community. But here's the second thing. The reason why Adam was lonely was not because he was so imperfect, but it's because he was made in the image of the one that is perfect. And and what's amazing, by the way, about our God that's so different than as we talked about last night, those false gods, like Confucius, Buddha, uh, Muhammad, they will say, just like our God, the one true God says, obey me. But you know what's different about our God? Our God says, yes, obey me, but commune with me. Obey me, but dine with me. In fact, every single week, that's how I want you to start your week. I want you to dine around a table with me. And and I love when David even gives the imagery, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my who? My enemies. That's what he's saying in John 15 when he said, you know like that love, that you didn't even love me, but I've loved you. He's like, that's what you were created in. And so we were made for relationships. We were designed for it. But another reason why relationships and friendships matter 
is because our quality of life goes up drastically when we have spiritual friends. There is a study that was done by the University of Virginia. And what they did is they took 40 of their college students and said, you're going to go backpacking. And they all gave them backpacks. And in that backpack was food. There was sleeping bag in there. Uh, there was a tent. Every single student's backpack weighed the same as all the other students. And they said, you're going to hike up this mountain and you're going to hike back down. But here was the difference. They said, we're going to divide 20 of you and put you over here. And the other 20, we're going to put over here. To the group that's over here, what you're going to do is you're going to hike that mountain with that backpack all by yourself. But to this group over here, you're going to go in groups of two or four up that mountain. And so they went up the mountain and then they came back down. They then interviewed the students that were a part of that. And to the group of people that were hiking up that mountain all by themselves, when they were interviewed after that hike, here's the comments that were the most mentioned. That was a very long hike. I never want to do that again. And that backpack was extremely heavy. But to the group of people that were hiking in groups of two or four, they mentioned these as the top three responses. That I know this was a part of some kind of study, but we want to do that hike again, even if you don't do a study. Number two, that was so enjoyable, but the most mentioned thing was this. Nobody, when even asked about it, said anything about the weight of the backpack. You know, every, every single one of us are carrying something. I don't know what it is for you, but everybody carries something. And it's those relationships that help lighten that load. That's why Solomon says what he says in Ecclesiastes 4. He says two are way better than one. They have a great return for their labor. And, and he gives this illustration of a threefold cord. And if you grew up in Boy Scouts like I did, they always talked about the need for that third cord. Because if you have two and you're, you're trying to pull something, friction will take place and what's going to eventually happen to that rope? It's going to snap. So you have to have that third one so the rope doesn't snap. But we know spiritually speaking what he's talking about. It's you and this person and, and who? God. It's kind of like if you've ever been at a wedding before. You don't know how they used to do the unity candle. Which, you know, that really long, awkward time when everybody doesn't know what to do. And there's, they play like the longest song possible. Anyway, but what's become more popular lately is weaving together this, this cord of unity between, you know, this is him and her and God in the middle. That's what he's getting at here. This threefold cord is not going to be easily broken. That is, if it's me, you, and God, this relationship is going to take off. It's going to do great. That's why the Bible also says if one can put a thousand to flight, two can put 10,000 to flight. That our quality of life goes up in a big way because of our spiritual friends. Um, my first two years at Faulkner uh, were not at all uh, what I had planned for them to be. I, um, I played a sport and it's not no blame on the people that were on that team because at the end of the day, the blame was on me. But you can be at a Christian university and you can find trouble. If you want to, you can find it. And that was me. And I was slowly disconnecting from church. I was slowly disconnecting uh, from a lot of activities. That's not how I was raised. That's not, uh, was, was not even a part of what I thought would happen. And I'll never forget my college minister uh, that was there at the time called me into his office and he was basically just trying to get straight to the point. He said, do you like where things are going right now? I was like, yeah, wait, what are you talking about? Like, I thought we were going to lunch. We're getting, getting all deep here. Uh, I was like, yeah. He's like, really, like you feel good about like everything in your relationship with God and all that. And his very pointed question made me realize, no, I, not really. And a, a lot of things uh, changed over those next few weeks. But one of the things that we had talked about, he said, Andrew, it's, uh, it's good that you're with other people that don't have a relationship with God and all that kind of stuff, but it's, it's impacting you. And you, you need to start getting you some spiritual friends and making those kind of the core of your life. And, and so I, I decided to make a decision that night. I reached out to another guy 
and I said, hey, what do y'all think about getting together in the dorm every Wednesday night, and what we're going to do is just get together and pray for each other. He's like, yeah, that sounds good. And then we had another guy and another guy and another guy. Uh, we started that my junior year, and every single Wednesday night for took me five years to graduate, so it was a little bit longer. So every Wednesday night for three years, we met in my dorm or my apartment, and, and we actually had a whiteboard that we developed over time that where we would pray for each other and all the different things that we were going through. And I, I wanna, these are the guys. Um, I'm the one with the Justin Bieber hair in the middle and my dad's making a frown face for some reason, but the rest of those guys, um, the, these were my spiritual friends, and what's interesting is about these group of guys, and I tell this to young people all the time, um, these be, were my groomsmen in my wedding, but every year these guys come to my house, and we pack our house full with all of our kids, and we hang out for three days. It, it's hectic, crazy, exhausting, but these are the friends that have stood the test of time. What I'm saying is you need these kind of friendships. And we're going to talk about how to develop them in just a second. But another reason why you need these friends, as I found out in my life, is spiritual friendship, it makes you. One thing that's fun to talk about, especially around this time of year, I was thinking about this today, is we love to talk about around the new year what things are going to be, what life's going to become. And we love to talk about dreams because we think, it's a, a dream that's going to determine the outcome of my life. Let me go ahead and tell you, your dream, it may be awesome, and it may even align with God's will, but dreams don't determine the outcome of your life. Largely more than anything, it's the people you surround yourself with that, that will. That we like to speak about the future in terms of like, like it's mysterious. It's not. We, we like to think about, well, one day, what is it that I'm going to be? Well, I'll go ahead and tell you, what are you doing right now? Because future you is just an exaggerated version of current you. I want you to think about right, right now your, your five closest friendships. I don't know if there's math on this. There's not a study that's done. I'm just throwing it out there. Think about your five closest friendships. That, that's what you're going to be. That's it. That if you show me who your friends are, I can tell you what the trajectory of your life is going to look like. Not because anybody in here is a prophet, but that's just the way it works. In fact, that's what this proverb says in Proverbs 13, 20. You walk with wise people, you will be wise. Then he says, if you don't walk with wise people, quite a big difference, you'll experience death. There's a difference between the two. So if that's my situation, and I realize that the people I'm not walking with are the right people, what do I do about that? Well, it turns out there's another proverb about that too. I think it's Proverbs 12, 26. It says, a wise person is cautious about their friendships. Now in Hebrew, the word cautious means spying out. He said a wise person takes a bird's eye shot of the relationships that they have and says, all right, what kind of keys am I giving certain people that they do need to hold or maybe don't need to hold? Who am I letting speak in my life? Who are those people? A wise person takes inventory of their friends. So I was asked to speak on something like this similar, and I made this graph to kind of try to help explain it a little bit. I want you to think of your relationships in your life like three concentric circles around you. Of course, you there in the middle. And the furthest out group is the group you care about and you are concerned about. For, for the young people that are here tonight, this could be people at your school that you really do you know like they could be Christians they could be non-Christians you really do care about what happens to them you're concerned if something happens to them here's what I wanted to tell you you can have care and you can have concern for somebody but that doesn't mean that they need to have a main voice in your life but then there's this next group that you bring a little bit closer this is the influence group these are the people that you when you're around them you're basically saying all right I'm gonna let you impact who I'm going to be. I might get a little bit more beneath the surface. We might spend more time together. I'm going to, you know, listen to your advice. And, and I know this, we're not trying to get into a dating thing here, and I don't want to get too much off subject, but for the younger people, just a word of advice, do not pick who you're going to date from the care and concern category. 
if you're not okay with them having influence in your life, don't date them. But then there's that next group, those intimate friends, those happy few, those main voices. Those are the people, those were my grooms, and those are the people that you choose and purposefully find yourself around to help get you to where you need to go. Now, now some of you might look at this list and you're like, I know, but, you know, I, I'm more of the introvert. Like, I don't really want to be around people. Well, th that's okay. That, that's fine. How you do friendships is going to be different. The introvert to the extrovert. Or, or some of you might say, well, you know, it doesn't really matter to me because, you know, people talk about relationships and community. Well, I, that doesn't, I'm not, that doesn't affect me. Well, that's not how that works, by the way. In fact, kind of an odd example of this, they did a study on fish to see how they swim in a school and what causes them in their brains to choose to swim in a school. So what they decided to do is they, they had this group of fish that was in this massive tank. They took one of the fish out. They did a partial lobotomy on one of the fish and took the part of the brain of the fish, uh, of that fish's brain out that tells the fish to swim in a school and then put that fish in the water. They put that fish in the water, and guess what the fish did? The fish swam by itself, but then guess what happened to the other fish? They joined him. That, that's what I'm saying, that you can say, well, it won't affect me. Oh, well, that's not how that works. They're coming. A, a wise person spies out their relationships. You have to be very proactive, not reactive when it comes to relationships. Our spiritual lives are determined more often than not by the people that you and I choose to walk with. Two of my favorite Bible characters are David and Samson. And I taught a leadership class a few weeks ago at Madison, and I, I had never thought about this until recently in, in looking at both of their narratives. If you look at the narratives of David and Samson, they are so incredibly similar, more than we oftentimes give it credit for. Think about it for just a second. Both of them, since they were young, were called by God to do something great. Both of them were called to be leaders. Both of them struggled with women. Both of them went to places that they shouldn't be. Both of them weren't in places that they should have been. And both of them touched things that they should not touch. And both of them tried to cover up things and, and spun this web of lies. The more you look at their parallels, they're both very similar. But one of them ended up laying under a, a pile of rubble while the other one has a crown on his head. What, what's the difference between the two? Well, let's think about David for a second. He had a Samuel that came along at just the right time and says, hey, I see something in you, man. He had a Nathan, somebody that was able to tell him a very hard truth when he needed it. But it didn't stop there. He had that Jonathan that was an incredibly faithful companion. I want to ask you a question. Can any of you name Samson's friends? Crickets, right? Let's think about these relationships. See, David had, for a lack of a better term, Samuel, who's that crown bestower. You need one of these friends. Th this is the kind of person that sees something special in you and encourages you in that. They, they might see that, man, I feel like God has called you to do this ministry or to be involved in this. Go after that. And let me tell you who some of the best people are. No, let me say this. I'll take it back. Who the best people are usually in the church for this are older members. They are so good at encouraging people. I can't tell you how many sweet old ladies, when I gave my last leader speech in third grade, I get up on stage, I drop it, all the notes are mixed together, and then instead of putting it in the right order, I was panicking and just started reading and went in the order, and it didn't make sense. It was awful. And I'm so glad there was no video then. It was a terrible lesson, made no sense. And these ladies, that was so good. In my head, I'm like, you're a liar, but thank you. I appreciate the, the words. Of it. But, but seriously, though, it really didn't go well at all. But that, that encouragement meant so much. These are the kind of people that see 
not just something in you, but they encourage it. They feed that fire. Because think about for a second, like David, when Samuel went to Jesse's house, he was like, I, I want to anoint one of these guys. And by the way, we're going to talk about that anointing tomorrow and how it connects with our baptism, but we'll, we'll save that for tomorrow. But when he went to Jesse's house, he's like, hey, you, you have any boys that we, we can, I can anoint to, to be king? He's like, yeah, I've, I've got these guys. He's like, you got any more? Yeah. Like, really? Like, you, you know, well, yeah, we got this other one, but he's, you know, out in the field writing songs nobody's heard of, chunking rocks at stuff. Like, you wouldn't be interested in him. He's like, no, bring him here. And before the sun goes down, he's anointed to be king. These are people that don't get jealous for your successes. They walk alongside you and bless it. These are those kind of relationships. You need a crown bestower, but you also need a Jonathan. Jonathan is one of the more amazing examples because if you go in how kings are supposed to become kings, is that his dad was who? Saul, who was the what? The king. And so you would think the next rightful heir to the throne would be who? Jonathan. But yet, Jonathan doesn't get the anointing David does, and, and he supports his friend when he didn't get the blessing he thought he should get. He was, he was excited for it. And he support, even at the expense of his own dad trying to kill his friend at the cost of his throne. He was this faithful companion. One of my favorite verses is this one. It says, Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David at Horish and helped him find strength in God. What I love about that verse is when you read that, you're like, okay, that's cool. That, yeah, he helped him find strength. David was 30 miles away. Jonathan walked 30 miles to help his friend find strength in God. Get you some friends like that. Be a friend like that. Because not only do we need crown bestowers, we need to be crown bestowers. Not only do we need faithful companions, we need to be faithful companions. But the third type of friend is this. We need those graceful truth tellers. This is more of the difficult one, right? Because if you remember in the text, what happened is David had spun this incredible web of lies. In fact, one of my commentaries had this quote in there. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when we first practice to deceive. You might have heard of that one before. He tried to lie and had to cover up that lie with another lie. He had committed adultery. He had put Uriah on the front lines. And Nathan comes to him, and, and the way he tells him that he was the man, he tells him a story, and, and then at the end of that story, he says, you are that man. He, he told him the truth, but he told him the truth in a, in a very graceful way. We have to be careful that when we tell the, every single word that comes out of my mouth and your mouth, has always got to be the truth, always. But we have to give truth in a way that people will receive it. That's why Jesus, it says, when he came to this earth, he didn't come full of grace or truth. He came full of grace and truth. Because if you have grace without truth, it's incredibly dangerous. Grace without truth is sentimentality. It'll make people really feel good about themselves but it will not invite them to change. But then truth without grace is also incredibly dangerous because it will give somebody a lot of information, but it will not give them information in the way that they will receive it. He came full of both. So we need to be full of the very thing Jesus Christ was very full of, grace and truth. He was one of these kind of people. Do you have those kind of folks? Like my college minister that was like, hey, do you like where things are going? Those kind of people that will tell you even a hard truth. You know, when I was thinking about all of these things, I go back to John 15, and Jesus said, I want you to think about the friendship I've had with you. Isn't this what Jesus did for us? Kind of like the woman at the well, he told her a hard truth. You know, I, I'm going to give you this new water, this new way of living, but you've had five husbands, and the man that you're living with now is not your husband. Go on your way and sin no more that Peter talks about how he sees us as a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his special possession. We, are, we are, are given this crown that we don't deserve. And he was a very faithful companion that came along 
at just the right time when you and I were dead in sin and helped bring us to a place of righteousness. I guess what I'm saying is this. Because of the friendship that Jesus has given us and continues to give us, you and I can be vulnerable with other people in a very healthy way. To reciprocate to others what Jesus has given to us. So what are some ways we can do this? Well, decision number one is relationally intelligent people are going to do this. They're going to decide to invest large chunks of time into relational development. They're going to choose to do this. I love the text in Acts chapter 2 right after they were baptized. We're going to talk about that tomorrow too. It says every, every I mean, excuse me, every, on Sundays and Wednesdays, they continued to meet together, right? Now what does it say? Every day. And, and in a, we love to talk about, I know I do, man, we need to be like that first century church. You know, you, you see what it said? That they sold their possessions and gave to their brother that's in need. Would you know how they knew that John had a need? They hung out with John. That you can't be with John three hours a week and, not, and know that John has a need. They were with each other all the time. And, and that's what I want to say is, is this. And I, when it comes to the way we talk about things in the church, we have to be very balanced. Because we are really, really good about making sure and talking about and emphasizing New Testament patterns of worship. And we should. But what I'm saying is we can't emphasize New Testament patterns of worship while ignoring New Testament patterns of fellowship. Both happen. And both need to be emphasized. The second thing is this. Relationally intelligent people understand that you can't fit deep community into cracks of an overburdened schedule. I am not the speaker to give you advice on this at all, of any of this really, but especially this. I, I'm the kind of person, and maybe some of you can relate to this, that I will have just had a conversation with my wife where she's like, Andrew, you've got to say no to some stuff. And I'll have this conversation with somebody and they will say, hey, Andrew, can you do this? And in my mind, I, I'm saying, nope, sure can't, have no time. There's not a possibility. And then I'll say, yeah, sure, when do you want me to start? Like how, what happens between here and there? I don't have control over that, I guess is what I'm saying. But, but when we look at that first century church and we love what they are and how they do things, we love to, to hold that in a very high esteem. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to experience first century fellowship on a 21st century timeline, and the two of those don't go together. And so because of that, like we talked about yesterday, you're going to have to say no to some really, really good stuff to say yes to better stuff. And, and saying no is, is difficult. I understand it's a very hard thing to do. But also relationally intelligent people learn to overcome the fear of rejection. I had talked with one of our counselors at Madison before I got this message together, and I said, can you just review my notes just to make sure, you know, what you think is right, wrong, or what you would add? And with this point, she mentioned something I thought was really interesting. She said, if you've been hurt in a relationship before, one of the most difficult things for people that have been hurt is to try relationships again because of the hurt. She says, so one of the things that we will encourage our, our clients to do is just to try a little bit at a time and, and you can actually create brand new neurons in your brain by trying new relationships. She said the way it works is this, that if you've been hurt in a relationship and you're like, I'm never gonna try a relationship again, I've been hurt, I'm not gonna do it again, I've, I've been there, I've done that. But when you step out and you try it again, you create a new neurological pathway. And then you try it again, a new neurological pathway, and that pathway gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I kind of think of it like when I was growing up, my dad, he, uh, he was really proud of his yard. It was kind of like the man thing to do in the neighborhood that all the dads, you know, would stand and look at each other's yards and talk about them, and we experienced that. And dad didn't want us to, to walk across the yard, but when he wasn't looking, we would walk across the yard. And we would walk across that yard, and it started to wear this path in the yard and it was giving it away that we were walking. And so why did we walk that path? Because it was easier, it was a shortcut. 
But in order for grass to grow back, what do we have to start doing? We had to go out of the way, didn't we? And then, and then the grass started to grow. That's what those neurological pathways actually create, that when you try relationships again, you actually start to create these new neurological pathways and it becomes easier and easier and easier. But as she mentioned to me, that doesn't mean you're not gonna get hurt. That doesn't mean that disappointment is not gonna be there. In fact, I put these quick points in there to be very slow to enter friendships, but even slower to exit. You know, especially now, I think it's the moment something bad happens, whoop, I'm out, you know. Don't keep score, but don't take a beating. When I'm, these two points, by the way, we're not talking about if you're an abusive, in an abusive situation to stay in it, no. Abuse is unbiblical, it's sinful, God hates it, and the Bible says in the book of Proverbs that a wise person sees trouble and flees. We're not talking about abuse. And, and I think sometimes even the text in Matthew where Jesus says to turn the other cheek, that's not about abuse. The, the cheek, if you remember back in the Bible days, represented a relationship that people used to greet each other with a holy kiss. And so when he says to turn the cheek, he's saying that you're going to re-offer the opportunity again to see if this relationship could work. That means you don't keep score, yes, but you also don't keep taking a beating. But then the other part is to make more deposits than you do withdrawals. That's why I said in all of these things, the faithful companion, the graceful truth teller, and that crown bestower, we're like, well, I need some of those. Well, are you being those? And the Bible also says the one who has many friends has also got to show themselves what? Friendly. It's a, it's a two-way street. So I want to end with this tonight. Uh, these are the roots of the redwood trees uh, that are out in California. This is a cartoon, of course, um, but it's a depiction of what the roots do. And some of you might know this. Uh, the redwood trees, I think they're somewhere between 350 to 400 foot tall trees. But what's interesting is you would think that these massive trees where you've seen people that they can't get their hand, like their whole body around it. I mean, it's several people linking arms around the, the massive trunk of this tree that you would think that the roots were incredibly deep and massive. But turns out that the roots of these trees aren't all that big and they don't go very deep either. And so if you had a redwood that stood in a field by itself and even just a 10 mile per hour wind showed up, guess what it would do? It would fall flat. But what they found is that these trees that have incredibly shallow roots, what they're doing is redwood trees are connecting with another tree, sometimes 30 trees over. And so if you try to pull down one of those, guess what you're gonna get? The whole forest. Isn't that a, a picture of, of the house of God, or at least shouldn't it always be? That's why Psalm 92, 13 says that those that plant themselves in the house of the Lord, they're gonna flourish. But it says plant, and I know something about plants because my granddad um, was a, a farmer. One of the things that he would talk about is that, that tree that you wanna transplant and move somewhere else, it can survive two moves. It can't survive more than that. But doesn't our world teach us that movement always equates to growth? Movement does not always equate to growth. Being planted and rooting yourself somewhere, it, it does. And so I ended with that tonight because maybe for some of you, as you spy out your, your relationships, you say, you know, not only do I need these in my life, but I need to be a better crown bestower. I need to be a faithful companion. I need to be a group, graceful truth teller. And I need to spy those people out to find them. And so maybe for some of you, you need prayers tonight. We're going to offer an invitation in just a second for you to request prayers for that. Uh, maybe for some of you, what it is, is that you haven't been the friend that you need to be. Or what it is is that you've chosen the wrong relationships and you've seen where it's gotten you and it's getting you. Now, I, I've never witnessed a person coming forward here because this is my first time. Last night was my first time here. But I would dare to say that anytime somebody comes forward here, whenever they come forward, um, they're greeted by somebody else that helps them and there's a line of people that come and encourage them and, and help them. I, I want you to see the body of Christ as a picture of that. 
as Planet Fitness says, a judgment-free zone. We've all got our issues. We've all got our problems. And I would dare to say that whatever it is that you are struggling with, there's someone else in this audience that is struggling with it too, that is looking for a ministry opportunity to help and encourage you. I know you're going to find that here. So whatever it is that you need tonight, maybe it's prayers to do relationships better. Maybe it's to put on Christ in baptism. To be joined together with these spiritual friendships. And, and to have what binds that friendship, the Holy Spirit, who God is. So whatever it is that you have a need of tonight, to put on Christ, or to confess sin, or to grow in your relationship, whatever it is, please come now. We